started. Okay, so um, we already started to talk with our speaker today, Professor Lawrence Anthony. Uh, I'm so happy that he agreed to join us and uh, give us two really well prepared sessions this week, this uh, today, and next Friday. So when we started talking about this in uh, February, I think, so uh, he really has prepared a lot uh, for us today. So Professor Lawrence Anthony is applied uh, Professor of Applied Linguistics at the Faculty of Science and Engineering, Waseda University in Japan. He has background in uh, the science field. He has a B science degree and MA and a PhD in TESO and applied linguistics. And he is the current director of the Center for English Language Education in Science and Engineering, which runs discipline specific language courses for the 10,000 um, students of the faculty. So his main research interests are in corpus linguistics. I'm sure many of you have heard of his end lab series, a lot of uh, very useful software for us uh, free of charge teachers to use. And, um, and a number of other research interests are educational technology and ESP and program design and teaching methodologies. So let's welcome Professor Lawrence Anthony to give us the webinar workshop for the coming three hours today. Thank you. I thank you very on. much. Thank you very much, Lillian. And thank you everybody for coming to this session today. Uh, um, of course, it would have been much nicer if we were able to have this event face to face in Hong Kong. Uh, it's one of the, the places I always love to go to and I have lots of friends and colleagues in Hong Kong. And it's been more than a year now since I was able to go there. I'd love to go back. But um, there are some advantages to uh, doing workshops online. Uh, it's easier to get to, um, of course. And also we will be able to record the session and you can then watch it again later if you ever wanted to to um, to check what I was saying and to refer to the notes and so on. Uh, so I hope you will find this three hour session um, useful. Uh, I'm not going to divide it exactly into two parts. Um, originally that was uh, the plan but um, I, I feel it's good to have some interaction in both parts of the session and also have some of my explanation in both parts uh, of the session. So I'll, I'll be following the time and um, hopefully we'll be able to get through everything I've planned and um, hopefully, as I said, it, it will be useful for you. Now at the moment, if you go to, I think Lillian has sent you all the link to the Google Drive, which has basically um, all, oh you haven't? Going you can, to, yes. Okay. Yes. Now. Okay. Oh, yeah. If you just if you put that into the chat maybe or into yes, wherever. In the, in the chat, yes. Okay. So everybody, uh, when, you're, when you're taking part, it is always good to be able to see the screen and okay. see also the participants and the chat. And if you have questions, uh, maybe you can post it into the chat later. Yes. These are the, these are the um, notes that I'm going to be using today. At the moment, they're not in that drive folder. So you will have to wait until after the session to get these. But everything I say in these slides will be explained in detail in the sessions. So it's probably better to not keep looking at these, these notes, which is why I didn't upload them immediately. Um, but they will be available later. So you don't have to take lots of notes on what I'm saying. They're all gonna be ready for you later. And also I've got some tasks prepared. And again, these are all in Word documents that you should be able to easily follow through the day. Thank you, Lillian, for uploading the drive link. Um, you don't need to look at those yet. Um, I'll be referring to those later, but uh, maybe you could just make sure that you can see the files in that link. Um, in fact, I will just just quickly um, share my screen so you can see what it should look like. Okay, so um, you should be able to see all of you guys in here. And if I maximize my screen, this is the drive folder that you should be able to um, click on and look at. You'll see that we have task one, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Not all the tasks are gonna be um, just independent learning. Some of them we will do together, which is why they're not all listed here. 
Um, but don't worry, we will do all of the tasks. So let me move that out of the way. Here is the group. Wow, we have a, a nice group of 41 people right now. Uh, but uh, of course, it's going to be good to share the screen, my screen, and see the slides. So let me upload, show you the slides right now. So on your screens now, you should be able to see my slide. Uh, you should also be able to see some of the faces in the room and hopefully my face there. And if you can't see me, you might need to change the setting just to be able to see what, uh, see me talking at the same time as these slides. Otherwise, it's going to be quite boring just to see slides the whole way through. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to be talking today about developing and delivering writing courses for the disciplines. When we say disciplines, that's not clear exactly. My main disciplines are in science and engineering, um, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, when I did the survey, I did know that other people were in uh, teaching business students. Um, there was some nursing. We also had uh, some people teaching English literature and Chinese literature. I wouldn't normally consider these to be the disciplines that would normally be referred to when we talk about writing courses for the disciplines. Um, my focus will be more on this kind of technical engineering science, non-English kind of disciplines, which we will often struggle to teach um, because we may not have that background ourselves. But if you are te teaching Chinese literature or English literature or something else, I still hope that some of these ideas from today will be useful in your own teaching. So yeah. This is only three hours, so we can't, I can't go into all the details of how I would approach this topic, but I do want to give you some pedagogical advice and practical advice on how to teach these classes face-to-face -face or in a remote or on-demand, in, in a remote or on-demand environment. So you can see my contact details here. So if you have any questions, you can email me at anthony at wasada.jp. And as I said earlier, I hope you can still see me. If you can, you can see my slides and I will be uploading those later. OK, so what are we going to do today? So I'm going to start with some basic concepts. Um, I understand that some of you will have a lot of experience in teaching writing and maybe some of you don't. So I want to start and get everybody on the same page by talking about these basic concepts. What is English for, for specific purposes? What are, are the four pillars of good course design? I've, it's not necessarily ESP course design. I think these are the four pillars of any course design, but I will apply them to ESP. And then how do we apply these four pillars in writing course design and delivery? I'll then um, focus on materials, tools, and methods for identifying writing objectives for the classroom. I think this is a really key point for this group because many of us um, are not from the disciplines that we have to teach. If we're not from that discipline, it becomes more challenging to decide what to teach for that class. Uh, we can't use our intuition, for example, because we don't have any intuition about how those disciplines are managed or run unless we are lucky to work in that discipline. So I want to talk about identifying writing objectives. And then the most important part, of course, today is teaching and managing a discipline-specific writing course. Now, again, I can't go into lots of detail about how I would run an entire course, but I'm going to focus on three parts of a traditional research paper writing course and look at how I would approach teaching the structure of research papers in any field, the language of research paper titles in any field, and then the materials and methods writing in any field. So I hope these three case studies will give you an indication or a hint of how I approach this, this, this topic. And I hope it will help you to kind of see where, to, where you could maybe go in your own teaching. Then, as I said, we're going to switch to some hands-on work. And here I'm going to talk first about the issue of machine translation, which is a hugely important discussion in uh, writing classes, which I see very little discussion about. It's a really important discussion, but almost nobody seems to talk about it. So I want to talk about that. And there's an exercise for you to do there. Then um, I'll talk about, I will show you, or we will together learn how to create reference materials for specific disciplines that we can then use to prepare our own teaching 
classes. And then we will analyze, uh, don't get scared, just, I just want to shift you guys over here. That's good, I can now see you better, that's good. So um, how do we teach the language of biochemistry? I guess nobody in the room is an expert in biochemistry. Is anybody, does anybody raise their hand? A biochemistry expert? No, great, that's perfect. So imagine you are stuck in an English writing class for biochemistry. How would you approach that? And uh, we'll start by looking at the language of figures and tables in biochemistry. And then I'm going to ask you, just a second, I'm going to ask you then to consider how you would create materials for the teaching of a results explanation, you know, the results section of a research paper in a STEM field. Now, of course, it, you, in the end, you may not be teaching STEM classes, you may be in business or in maybe Chinese literature, but the, the fundamental principles here are still the same. So I hope you can apply this idea of analyzing the language of something you really don't know much about. And then how do you like form some kind of classroom activities, some materials that would be useful for the students of that discipline. Um, okay, so that's the idea. At the end of the day, I hope we'll have uh, some time for Q&A so that you can ask me questions or ask my opinions and we can discuss together some of these real world issues and challenges in teaching discipline specific writing classes. Okay, I want to start then with um, a quick review of the survey that I gave you all and thank you for um, participating in that. I hope you all did, saw it. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, oh, Lillian, if somebody does come in and hasn't muted their mic, just if you could just mute that, it would be great. Okay, so I asked everybody, first, what is your own discipline specialization? I w because I wanted to get a feel of how far away are you from the disciplines that you actually have to teach. And we can see here um, a fairly expected result that many of us in the room are from English for academic purposes, or maybe TESOL, some people from linguist literature, applied linguistics. Um, somebody wrote general English. Um, I don't consider general English to be a specialization. Um, and somebody wrote, I don't really have a specialization, which is very honest. And um, I think many of us might feel a little bit that way. Okay, and then what is the most common discipline specialization of your students? Of course, this is the key question here. And we had um, business and economics, science, science and engineering, ICT education, political science. The important point here is that the disciplines you are teaching are not your own specialization. So there's a gap between what we as teachers know and what the students need to know, because we are not from that field. Again, I, I comment that some people wrote English literature, Chinese literature, Chinese language. I'm not sure how that relates to the disciplines in the, in the title of the, of the session, but um, again, I hope some of the points will be useful. Now, I asked the question, have you ever read a journal paper published in one or more of the target disciplines that you teach? I, now, the reason for this, of course, is that if you are trying to teach students how to write, for example, a research paper in biochemistry or physics or, or maths, you really need to know what that looks like because otherwise, how can you teach it? If you don't know it, if you've never seen it, how can you teach it? The great thing here was that 80% of you said, yes, you have seen a published paper in one of these target disciplines. That's really good. I would say that's very high compared with many other sessions and people I've worked with. Um, but we still have 20% of people saying, no, they haven't. So if there's one thing to take away today is if you go into your business class or your STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics class or nursing, make sure that you see what they have to write in the field. Go and go to the, the library, you know, download the PDF file and look at the paper that they have to write. If it's nursing and they have to write, I don't know, case reports, go and get an example of a case report because if you don't know what they're aiming for, how can you possibly teach it? Okay, so that's the point there. And the last question here was, have you ever co-written a journal paper for publication in one of these target disciplines? Nobody has, 100% no. This is a bit of a worry really, because you might have read a paper 
in a field like biochemistry. But if you've never actually written it yourself or co-written it, you won't really know the process by which this, that paper was created. Is it done in a team as part of a team? Is it done by one person with advice from other people? Is it done through machine translation? Is it done through copy and pasting from previous papers published from the lab? So it's really good to kind of get a feeling of not only what the target output is, but how do you get to it? So um, I hope you can see this. I've got a journal here. So it's full of papers, right? It's full of papers. How were they created? And it's good to have some idea. And if you don't, again, another key point for today is go back to your university, go to the department that you are teaching in, for example, business or, or science and engineering, and speak to somebody ask them how do they produce their writing okay of course you can read journal papers about this topic as well okay and then what is your greatest challenge when uh, teaching this type of course well we have subject specificity problems like understanding theories and having subject knowledge and understanding jargon and so on it's kind of what i expected a, a challenge is understanding what you're supposed they are supposed to write problems of low level students and different expo this is an interesting comment different exposure to english literature so i was wondering if the teacher here was forcing students to study english literature even if they're from a different discipline if you are i think you should stop that's not a great um, discipline to teach if the students are not in that discipline and they have no interest in it and then things like too many resources and not showing which is the best and uh, my teaching is not discipline specific okay Finally, question, what questions do you have for the seminar? Well, there's lots of questions here, and I hope to answer many of them, if not all of them, during the sessions. But if I don't, I'm, please, at the end of the Q&A, at the end when we have Q&A, please come back and look at some of these. Um, things like, um, does an EAP course at university need to be discipline specific? And the answer is, no, I don't think it does. Um, how to fake it till you make it um don't fake it make sure that you know you make sure you have something that you can give to the students which is valuable and make sure that you know what that is and that you you understand your contribution to the class um it's easy to kind of feel very defensive in a class like this that the students know more than you and that you don't know what's going on but I'll come back to this later, but you should have some confidence that you do contribute to the class with some valuable information that the students don't know and even their professors don't know. So I'll come back to these questions hopefully later. Okay, so let's go to the basic concepts of, of English specific purposes and um, this will set the ground for everything else I'll talk about today. So uh, I'm going to be using, I'm going to be referring to the definition that I published in this book called Introducing English for Specific Purposes. If you don't know what this field is and don't know these core concepts, I do recommend you get this book, of course. Um, please do consider it. It's paperback and very cheap, so it should be easy to get. It's also been published through a Chinese publisher as well soon, so it should be very cheap for students as well. Okay, so in this book, I define ESP like this. So English for specific purposes is an approach to language teaching. First, it's, it's our job, language teaching that targets the current or future academic or occupational needs of learners. So it's not just what they are doing now, but it could be what they will do in the future. And these needs are not necessarily language specific. For example, they may be nurses. So what are the language, well, what are the needs of nurses and how can you assist with the language component of their job? That's the idea. They may become researchers in university. So how can you contribute to the language component of that need to be a researcher? And it focuses on necessary language genres, like types of language, like research papers or email or business letters and skills uh, to address these needs. Um, skills like how to publish and how to present yourself in a good way. And then it assists learners in meeting these needs through the use of general and dis 
discipline-specific teaching materials and methods. You'll notice here the word general as well as discipline-specific. So depending on what the need is, you can use general English methods and materials to get there. It doesn't have to be unique and discipline specific all the time. Okay, so ESP is a kind of combination of this English for academic purposes and English for occupational purposes, and it kind of blends the two. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. I think most of us are in EAP right now, but, that, um, but you need to consider the EOP perspective as well. Now, in the past, a lot of people have written about ESP teachers as practitioners, and John Swales is a good example. In 1985, he talked about the ESP practitioner not only needing to be a teacher, but also a course designer, a materials provider, collaborator with specialists, a researcher of the language, evaluator of the program. And that's a lot of work for one person to do. And many people see ESP as like, difficult and lots of work and ugh, very specific, very hard working, hard work. I don't like this way of seeing ESP at all. I think in this book, uh, it's better to see ESP uh, being uh, people as team members. So of course you, you may be the teacher, but there's also the students and also some of these administrators and you really need to be contribute all of the people need to be contributing to the course. So it's not just you doing everything, but you need to talk to the administrators, talk to the departments, find out what they need, what they want, what they're doing, talk to the students, let the students bring materials that they want to aim to be able to create and work together to create this course. So that's really important that you're working not on your own. You're working with a team of other people. You're talking to the departments, you're talking to the students, and you're also contributing yourself to this course. Okay, so what are the four pillars? Well, um, I've got here an ESP course, but it could be any course really. So we start off with needs analysis. So who are we teaching? Where are we teaching? That becomes really important now because we're not teaching in classrooms anymore. When are we teaching? Also important because students may be studying these at night or at the weekend. And why are we teaching it? Really important. It's not just we're teaching grammar. Why are you teaching grammar? Because it's important. Why is it important? Because they're not very good at it. Do they need to be good at it? Well, and keep going like that. So what are the language and learning objectives? What are you going to teach in the classroom? This is a problem if you are not from the field because you may not know what they need to be able to do. And then how do you do it? So what materials and what methods do you use and how well are you achieving these goals as a teacher? How well are the students achieving these goals as a student? And how well is the course running from the administrator's point of view? Yeah, they're quite simple, really, these four, these four pillars. So let's just quickly review these again, and then I'll apply them to actual writing classes. So first of all, in terms of needs, we have three aspects, necessities, lacks, and wants. I would say this is the most misunderstood aspect of course design I've ever seen. Many, 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 many teachers think that needs analysis is asking the students what they want to study. It's not at all about that. It's a little bit about that, but there's much more to this. So the first thing is, who are the stakeholders? That could be the university administrators. It could be the teachers. You are one of the stakeholders as a teacher and the students as well. And what do the stakeholders want? Now, that's, not, that's one part of needs but it's not the only part. So what do you want to teach in the classroom as a teacher? What do the students want to study in the classroom? And what do the administrators above you, your bosses, want you to do in the classroom? If everybody wants to do the same thing, that's great, but often it's not the case. You may have administrators wanting you to teach more and the students wanting you to teach less and you wanting to teach your thing. So what the, you've got to think about these course goals, target grades, specific content. One of you might want to teach literature, but another, the students might want to study biochemistry. So how do you fit these together? What do they want? 
And more important than what do they want is what do the stakeholders lack? So at the administrative level, they may lack the money for more teachers. You may want more teachers, but they may not have the money. They may lack the space for small classrooms. You want small classrooms, but the admin don't have the space or the time for these classes. As teachers, you may lack time to prepare. You may lack energy to prepare. You may lack experience in the field that you have to teach. And students may also lack the time and the energy and the knowledge of the field, the experience of writing, and they may lack interest in the course. So these are all problems. If these are the problems, you have to address them. So how can you generate more money for the class or more space for the class? How can you get more experience as a teacher? How can you make students more energetic or more interested in what they are doing? And finally, the necessities, the needs, we often call these. So what do you need to do in the class? What do you need to do? What do you have to do in the class? So what are the minimum grades of the students that they need to get? What is the minimum performance for passing the course? What are the minimum scores on student evaluations of the teacher? Things like that. Okay, then we'll go to methods, materials. I'm going to come back and refer to these again in the context of writing in a moment. Okay, so let me just go through them quickly first. Okay, materials and methods. So what ready-made materials are suitable for the classroom? Of course, we have textbooks and online sites. We have student samples that they can give us to help us create the class. There's lots of books on EAP, but there's not so many books on, for example, biochemistry English. So what are available and what custom materials can you create or can be created? like handouts and vocabulary lists and self-access materials and so on. And who should control this learning? So should it be the teacher doing everything, creating all the materials and giving it to the students? Should the students be in some sense controlling their own learning by them getting the materials and then bringing them to the class and showing the class, showing the teacher and, or studying on their own? Then I'll come back again to writing in a moment. Then we have language and learning objectives. So what language and skills should they learn in the class? What should they learn in other classes not related to English? And what should they be studying outside of class for homework or uh, on their own? And what should students, who should students learn from? Should they learn just from the teacher? Should they learn from other students? Should they learn from online materials and so on? So should you be teaching directly? Should you be facilitating interaction? Or should you be just sending them off to some website to learn? And what language and skills will students find easy or difficult to learn? If it's easy, then maybe any of these ways will work. If it's difficult to learn, then they need more time, more energy, more help, more support, and so on. And finally, evaluation. So how well have the learners achieved the goals of the course? Of course, this means you have to have clear goals to start with, not just like get better in English. They need, you need to have clear goals and then you need to measure how well the students achieve those goals. But also how well did you support the learners in their learning? Do you help them or do you hinder them in their study? And how well do the administrators support the teachers? Okay, are they helping or are they like causing trouble? How happy with the course are the administrators and the teachers and the learners? So they may have got better, but they may hate the class, which is a problem for the future. And what can be done to improve the class for the future in terms of needs and objectives and materials and, and evaluation procedures and so on. Okay, so that is a very quick overview of what I see as the four kind of core principles of, just a second, uh, of um, course design. So let's go and look at some practical advice now for actual writing classes, because that's what we're doing today. Everybody, are you, I can see most of you, are you all following what I'm saying? Is it all good? 
Yeah, thank you, Lorena. I can see you nodding and showing me your thumb. That's great. Okay, so let's go back and just review these four things again, but now for writing classes. Okay, so who is con in control of the course? This is a question about stakeholders. So are you, is it the specialist departments telling you what to do? Is it the English department? Is it the language center? Is there no control at all and you can do what you want? That's the first place to start with when you're running the class. If, if, the, course, if the course is controlled by specialist departments or English departments or somebody else, you need to ask the managers to explain the goals. Now, I hope you are doing this. I'm sure experienced teachers here are doing this, but I know many don't. So you need to go to the department and say, what are the goals of this clause and why are these the goals? Get lists of the target disciplines that the, just let me get my pointer showing. That might be easy to see. Get lists of the target disciplines that will be coming to the class. Get examples of writing materials that you are supposed to be teaching. Get information about the goals. Why do you need to teach a writing class? Why does it need to be journal papers? Where do these pub papers get published? How, you know, what is the, what do the course managers want you to do and why? If you disagree with the goals, you should think about discussing with the managers changes. It's kind of obvious. Once you understand the goals of the class, and if, you, if, you, if you, you are in control, you should form your own goals as well. You should explain these goals to the students. Explain the context that they're in. For example, English in the world of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Explain how important English is in these fields. Show them the syllabus for the course. Explain the basic plan. Get them to understand what they're going to do and why they're doing it explain the main tasks, explain how you're going to evaluate their achievement of getting these goals. It's all really quite obvious. You'll notice that um, I haven't mentioned students yet, okay? Of course, you should also survey the students and identify their lacks and their wants, but not necessarily their needs because they won't know their necessities. They won't know what they need to do in the future but they may know what they can't do now. So it's good to know what that is. So here's a, an example survey that I use for my students. And you might want to try this with your own students asking, I ask them, what is their discipline? What journal do you want to target in your first or your next research paper? Have you ever written a research paper? Have you ever published a research paper? When you write in English, do you use machine translation? What questions do you have about writing research papers that you hope to get answers to in this course? It's a really good question, number six, because it can help you form some of the content of the class. I did that with you guys, asking you what you want to know when you take my seminar. Here are some typical answers um, uh, to these, sorry, typical questions from the students about what they want to study. Lots of students ask about organization and structure, like I want to learn how to output my idea in English. I hope to learn how to write a refined introduction. So not very clear, it's not vocabulary or grammar, it's much more meta. Uh, meta. It's like, how do I write? <laughs> A lot of questions about flow and style, like how about formal writing or the proper use of tenses. They know past tense and present tense, but how do they use tenses properly? I tend to use then, how should I correct it? Is then wrong? They think it's wrong, but is it? And how should it be changed? And then we've got questions about public uh, writing quality and how to publish. So how can I keep my sentences simple and easy? How can I explain my data more efficiently? How can I improve my ambiguous descriptions? How can I emphasize what I want to say? How can I de decide where to submit a paper? Are there any problems using machine translation tools? I think these questions very well capture what students actually are thinking. They're not wanting grammar explanation. They wanna know what grammar is appropriate. How do I get a better, clearer introduction and so on. So in your course, you should be focusing not on how to use the past tense, 
but we, when is the past tense good to use and why? I hope that's okay. But have a look at these later. Um, um, I think these questions are really interesting and they capture what lots of students often ask about. Okay, so what about then the objectives? I think you need, I think it's very important to focus not only on the language of the output. So my journal paper, as I showed you earlier, this is the journal paper that I aim for, for example, with my students. It's not only important to tell or teach the students or help the students to learn this language, but also the skills to publish the research. How do they go from their idea in their head to a published paper in a journal? So this is a, a course syllabus, very simple outline. It's not a syllabus, it's just an outline that I use it my, in my PhD's writing course. And you'll see here in green, these skill aspects, the importance of writing, the meaning of research, how to avoid plagiarism, not, not how to cite and reference, that's one thing, but how do you stop copying and pasting and how do you paraphrase well? How do you submit a paper to a journal? How do you respond to referee comments? Things like that. So of course we have things like the structure of the research paper and organ audience purpose, organization, flow, style, presentation, and things like writing the methods and the results and the abstracts and so on. But then also focus on these other more difficult skills like how to defend a position in a, in a response to a referee. Okay, uh, so if you think about what the students will have to do, for example, in STEM or in business, maybe, they have to decide a target journal. So help them. They may not, not know what journal they need to submit to. So what is the best journal in their field and how do they um, submit to that journal? What is the submission procedure? Oh, then we have the main part, yeah, writing the paper. Yeah, that's okay. But then what about the cover letter that needs to go with the research paper? And how do they submit everything online? What materials do they need to read and write online to submit this paper? And then, of course, we have the referees and responding as well. So focus on these aspects as well. So those are the objectives, right? Language and learning objectives. In terms of materials and methods, okay. Well, Highland, um, I'm sure many of you know his name. He was in Hong Kong for many, 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 many years. Um, Highland wrote over many years that ESP courses, any basically science and engineering or discipline specific course should focus primarily on specific language skills and genres of particular disciplines. Now, this is his very important and very strongly put view that you need to focus on the disciplines. This is a problem for us because the disciplines might be very difficult, like visualization and computer graphics, components and packing technologies. Whoa, what is that? How can we possibly focus on a particular discipline when we have no idea what this discipline is about, right? Well, this is, I'm going to give you an example of this, just, just in case you're not sure that you don't know this, I'm going to give you a quick quiz. Okay, how many of you are mathematicians? Anybody? Okay, so this is a quiz. I'm going to give you some sentences that students would say, is this okay? Can I use this in, the, in my writing? So which of the following sentences have mathematicians used in international journal articles? So is it okay? or not. Here's the first one. Let us suppose that this occurs. So can you, if in the, um, in the participants list, you should be able to see like raise your hand. Yeah. If you think this is okay, that this is something that the students could write, just raise your hand now and see if it's is that okay. What do you think? Two people? Is that it? Just two? Three? Okay. 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 I can see yeah, some people. Yeah. Thumbs up. Like, a lot of people are saying, mm, maybe not. Uh, is that okay? Let us suppose. Okay. Oh, I'll, I'm going to, I'll go through all of these. Okay. Let us suppose. Totally okay. Let us, let us is really common in mathematics. It's used all the time. Okay. Did you know that? Or would you advise students to write in the passive voice or something? 
Okay, let's clear the, um, the um, hand raising and let's do again. Second one. It is easy to see that the equation is a smooth function. It's easy to see. <laughs> is that okay in writing? This is a writing class. Yes or no? Yes, people. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, no, is that, is that okay? Can you say that? Well, so do I have my cursor? Yeah. No, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen easy to see in mathematics writing. It might be possible, but not in here. Okay, what about the next one? Of course, we have no reason to believe that this picture is complete. We have no reason to believe that this is... So can you talk about beliefs in mathematics writing? Yes or no? Ah, oh, lots of yeses there. A few, quite a few yeses. Yeah, that's fine. I've seen that in research paper writing. How about this next one, the easy one here? But if the initial tumor is large enough, then it will grow. Can you say but in writing? Yeah? What do you think? But is okay in technical writing for mathematics? Okay, a lot of hand raising there. Yes, it's fine. In mathematics, it's fine. The, the graph is clearly weird. <laughs> okay, this is um, Paul Erdos, a very weird looking mathematician. What do you think? Can you say weird in mathematics writing? Would you correct this? Nobody's saying yes to this. It's not good. No, you can't say it's weird. Not in math. Well, I haven't seen it anyway. Last one. Anyway, we have that EQT is bounded. Anyway. Can you say that in mathematics writing? Yeah? No? Yeah? No? Uh, one person says, yeah. It's fine. It's used a lot. This, is, this example shows us the problems of teaching discipline-specific language. If we as teachers cannot answer the question, is it okay or not, how can we advise students? If they bring any way we have, and you say, oh, no, you can't use any way. That's too conversational. You should change that. You're not helping the students. Oh, just a second. I've got a call. Is that from Lillian? No? Okay, good. <laughs> I hope you can still hear me. So if a student brings any way to the class and you're correcting it and crossing it out and changing it to therefore, you're not helping the students, you're damaging their writing. Things like if you correct but into however, you're damaging them because it's fine. So that's the problem that we have. And I'm going to address this for the next for the next um, two and a few hours. Um, okay, so what this is, this relates to the question about do these classes need to be discipline specific? There's something called the ESP specificity continuum, where if you think about it, we start with kind of general ESP. I would call this like general English in some way, academic listening, note-taking, logical structures like um, uh, hypothesis, uh, 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 or about um, uh, model and then real, abstract real, problem solution, general specific, things like that. Then we have kind of intermediate ESP. I think there's like research paper writing next week's presentation English, things like that. And then we have really specialized DSP like machine specifications, safety manuals, customer support documentation in companies. So we start with kind of like first year at Jap university and then end up with companies at the other end. And we are kind of in the discipline writing classes are somewhere in the middle there. Now, if you think about this continuum, as we go further to the right, we as teachers know less and less about the topic, right? We have no experience, we have no intuition, we have more difficulty with this very specialized DSP. So we need to change the methodology. So on the left, we can have more of a teacher-centered approach where the teacher shows the materials, they introduce the vocabulary list, they explain the logical functions and so on. Students do exercises and then the teachers correct and advise the students. On the right, we really need this learner-centered approach where the students bring in what they have to do and they discuss their problems with the teacher. And the teacher then responds to the student with suggestions for how to improve what they need to do. And the students respond with, oh, no, no, that's not right because look, 
we can say anyway. Oh no, that's okay because I've got an example here. So the student follows up on the teacher's response. It's kind of reversed, but you still have a valuable role to play because you are an expert in language. So you can help the students improve. You can look at their writing and suggest possible problems, possible problems. For example, if they wrote but, you could say to them, Many times, but is not appropriate in a academic writing, however, it might be better, go and check it. That's enough, go and check it. You don't need to say, don't do but, don't use but, use however. You can say, check the style. Go to your journal and check the style of these research papers. Is it conversational or is it very formal? And the, the students can follow that up and look, and that will help them a lot. So that's this difference in perspective. And I think we really need to adopt a more of a learner-centered approach. And one of the most famous learner-centered approaches in writing is data-driven learning. This is helping learners to create, search, and analyze language databases, we call these corpora, or one corpus, two corpora, of general and specialized English. And if you get this book, Discipline Specific Writing, um, Flower Jew and Cosley wrote the, um, edited this book. I've got a chapter in here on how to use these tools. But this idea was first proposed in 1991 by Tim Johns. It's carried out by learners in the classroom and it's through them interacting with this corpus, this database. And it involves inductive, self-directed language learning activities or exercises. They look at their own data and they form their opinions about the writing. So, and the teacher has a role of guiding the students, not in what to write, but how to find the answers. What to look for, maybe is the best way to say it what to look for and how to find things, the actual answer becomes the student's problem. Okay, so the idea here is that learners are like language researchers, like us in many ways. So they analyze a corpus with some software. They look up the bottom-up features, you know, the words and the grammar, the lexical grammatical features, the top-down rhetorical structures, the st discourse features, and so on. They identify the patterns, they de deduce rules, they form hypotheses, and they apply these in their future writing, listening and writing tasks. That's the idea. So they do the work in some sense, and we just kind of help them. And I'm going to show you some examples of this a bit later, okay? And we're, you're going to have a chance to even do some of this. Um, but uh, uh, what the teacher does in this setup is basically facilitate the student's learning. So the teachers show the students how to collect data, how to select a good corpus software tool, how to form search queries, like how do you type in the search words, how to interpret the results that the students are seeing and how and help them apply what they're finding in their own writing. So you'll see here, there's no content, there's no vocabulary or grammar here. It's more about coaching the students to be able to find their own answers. I think this is, in many ways, this is the only way we can go. Because if you have to teach biochemistry, how are you going to teach them content? You can't because you won't know it, but you can help them find their own answers to their questions. They have questions, you can help them find the answers with this approach. If you're not sure it's really good or not, um, Bolton and Cobb did a big meta-analysis of 205 studies of DDL and they found large overall effects for both control and experimental group comparisons with a D, uh, Cohen's D of 0.95, which is really high. And if you just look at pre and post test, it's huge with a, a, a Cohen's D of 1.5, which is very, very strong effect. So very, very effective approach to teaching. And that's exactly, if you want to know how I teach technical writing to PhD students in civil engineering, chemistry, bioscience, veterinary studies, all of these different fields, I adopt this approach. So I have a textbook. 
I hope you can see these. I've brought them, brought them to meet you today. Now, these textbooks basically introduce data-driven learning. They have some basic concepts of like basic writing, basic ideas of formal academic writing style, some basic ideas of how to structure a research paper, but they also then have these aspects of data-driven learning. So the books introduce software and they have exercises that show students what to do, what to, what, uh, how to start the software, what kind of things to search for and how to look at the results and see them. So students end up loading into the software their own journals like IEEE journals, JAX's chemistry, self biochemistry, all the Elsevier journals, physics. They would load this data into the software and then they look at the results. And they find their own answers. So it's kind of a combination of traditional EAP of like formal academic writing style, grammar, explanations and tense and things, and then integrating that with this very subject specific DDL kind of approach. Okay, um, I will show you some examples of this a little bit later. Okay, what about evaluation? Just to finish this section. So you need to give the students well-defined goals and evaluate them on how well they reach those goals. So really simple, right? Give them goals, how, do they, um, how well do they achieve them? And that's it. If you have clear goals, then you can evaluate them. These are the goals that I have for my class, um, my PhD writing class. So I want them to understand the importance of writing, understand the characteristic features of research papers. A is audience, purpose, organization, flow, style, presentation. Understand the importance of references and citing and avoiding plagiarism, looking at the calls for paper and the instructions for authors and using text tools to identify style and flow and presentation features and how to write the title, abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion and conclusion. So it's kind of obvious, right? I'm giving these clear um, goals separated now. And then I ask them to write a title, write an abstract, write an introduction, write a methods, write a results, and evaluate their quality with a good grading rubric. So this is an A plus level and they have the mechanics and citation and paragraphs and style and grammar and organization of these different aspects. Have a look at this later. You don't need to look at this in detail now, but basically what I aim for them to achieve, I check do they achieve those goals? Now, this is a very teacher-centric way of approaching this, that it means I've got to evaluate their ability to cite and reference and so on. And that could be difficult for some of us if we're not familiar with the actual field. So one of interesting approach, which I would definitely recommend you try, is an approach introduced by my colleague, Chie Nakamura, uh, Wasada here. And her idea is online randomized student peer review. So what we have here is basically we use a learner management system called Moodle. And in Moodle, we set up a system so that students can uh, uh, ask to review other students work. So it gets randomized. So the students submit their writing and it automatically goes to a different student and the student is instructed like here, I hope you can see this. Does the introduction have an appropriate in-text citation style? If not, tell the author how previous literature should be cited. So the student looks at another student's writing and says, do they cite properly? And then they write some comments like, oh, they should do this or they should do that. Now, if they're in the same field, they're gonna give really good advice here. Yeah, but maybe they're not in the same field. And if they give bad advice, what does the student do? The student who gets the bad advice still has to kind of process this. They have to think, okay, so he thinks I'm citing it wrongly. Let's check, let's go to my journal. Let's see the citation method. Oh, it's, no, that student's wrong. He's stupid, no, I'm, I'm okay. But you see the process that they've done is actually they've gone back and checked their own citation style. So they are now much more confident about what they need to do. 
It's a really good way. And with, with this Moodle system, you can set up this kind of workshop approach where you kind of set up each phase of the um, review system. And basically the teacher doesn't have to do anything at this point. They just let the students review each other's work, check spelling, check grammar, citation, tense, whatever. Then when the students revise the work, then the teacher can look at it and see if it's good or not. So it saves a lot of time as well as from the teacher's perspective. It's also really good from the student's perspective because they're getting a lot of feedback on what they're doing. Not all of it will be right, but they do need to know that because peer review, as we know, as, a, as researchers ourselves, we know that peer review is often wrong. They don't understand what you wanted to say and their comments are not always correct. So you need to respond to the comments, right? So think about that. It's a really good idea, I think. Okay, uh, it's coming up to one hour. So I think it might be good to have a little bit of a break before we continue to the next part. Oh, so there's a question here. Can this online peer review system be set up as easily as on other platforms such as Canvas? I guess so. It's basically an idea of um, if the student, can you get the students to be able to look at other students writing? If you can, then you can set it up. You'll just need, you'll need to have this way of having one student be able to see another student's work. And then you can just provide instruction even in the classroom or in the online system on what they should be doing with the report when they get it. But um, for Moodle, it's really straightforward with the workshop approach. Okay. There is another one on uh, the content hours of the sample PhD course. Okay, so that's, that's one, one class a week, 90 minute contact hours, that's all. Right. And earlier there was a question about the Corpus software that you're using yeah. uh, that the students can load. I put in the link to your whole series of... Uh, yeah, and, and we will do. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And we can actually do a little bit of that later as well. So I'll show you that when we do the hands-on bit later. Should we have a little break, say five mm. minutes? Yeah. What do you think, Lillian? Yes. Great. Yeah, okay. I think it's with online learning, I've got these big bright lights in front of me as well. It might be good to have a little break. Five minutes yeah. and then let's come back at 16.05 for part two, kind that, of. That means 3.05 here in Hong Kong. So oh, five sorry. Minutes. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, okay. Three, not 4.05, everybody. No, 3.05. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, then. See you yes. in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.